Hi everyone, Alec here from reddit slash r slash hex encounter. We got started a little bit early since we were all set up uh, for our second installment of the How It's Played series. Uh, for this installment, we are playing uh, GMT's Unconditional Surrender World War II in Europe, and I have the pleasure of having uh, designer Sal Vasta joining me on the recording. Sal, welcome. Oh, thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, and so our hope, as with the last one, is uh, those of you uh, that are joining us on the many platforms that are out there are able to uh, uh, join us. Um, we have a game lobby live in Vassal. For those of you that have uh, followed the link instructions on how to install Vassal in the module, so feel free to join us in the Reddit lobby. I see we have one uh, community member in the lo in the lobby with us. Hope and here comes a second. Uh, we also have a uh, Skype call in progress, which will accept or should accept anyone calling in. I have uh, posted that link in the uh, original post on Reddit for uh, this event. I'm going to uh, see if I can uh, paste it one more time in uh, da, 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 in our here we go. Uh, in the Vassal here. So for those of you on Vassal, that is the link, uh, hopefully, to get in on the call. And um, with that, those of you on Twitch, unfortunately, I am not watching uh, the Twitch uh, comments right now. I, I uh, don't have the uh, text set up. So I guess uh, we'll just start this with Sal and I, and we'll uh, keep an eye on the comment scroll in Vassal. And anyone that joins in on the uh, Skype call, feel free to uh, interject with your questions. The hope here is that we're going to be able to uh, help explain some of the concepts and how to play uh, Unconditional Surrender. So Sal, how did you want to get started? Uh, well, I, I thought we would uh, start with the 1939 campaign um, to show some land combat when we attack Poland using a standard historical start and then uh, with that be able to talk about uh, the politics uh, aspect of the game um, and some of the a little bit of the economy which uh, tends to perplex some of the uh, new players uh, in particular the politics the economy is fairly straightforward so shouldn't have a problem there okay yeah. so um, in this general, um, one thing I, it's always important for a lot of players particularly to wrap their head around is how do I win? Ah, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, of course, that certainly would depend on the scenario. Uh, if we are talking about the full campaign game, then uh, to win as the Axis player, uh, Germany needs to have conquered uh, or caused to collapse either France or uh, Russia uh, and also has to avoid itself collapsing by the end of the game. Okay. So the campaign, it's pretty straightforward. I went that way because uh, I found that any sort of sudden death type of automatic victory mm -hmm. condition resulted in the Axis player using that as his benchmark for whether they should continue or not. I see. Uh, and then, uh, so if... if for example, if we said that uh, if you collapse both France and Russia uh, and you own Moscow, the Axis win, uh, well, then players would end up playing to that. And if once they got to the point where they realized that was not possible, they would stop playing. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and I wanted to create a game where there was incentive to play the whole war so that way both, uh, both sides get to enjoy uh, beating each other up for a while. And so give the Axis player an incentive to play the, the defensive retreat, the, the uh, hold off the allies on both fronts long enough to reach a settlement, to, to, uh, to fight out the end of the war? Yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so, so that's how we went. Of course, um, in these larger um, scenarios and these, these kind of huge scoping strategic efforts, of course, it's also useful to uh, set for yourself <laughs> more limited objectives and I, I suppose yes. for the moment you're looking to steamroll Poland. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. It, 
Well, yeah. uh, let's uh, perhaps just, unless anyone's got a question uh, on the channel or in, in Vassal, uh, I guess let's go ahead and just uh, start walking through the, the sequence of play. Uh, before we do that, let me walk, uh, for those of you watching the stream, uh, walk folks through the Vassal module. Uh, this module here is one of the more complete modules you will find, and it's, it's actually uh, very well put together, very well done. Um, uh, walking across the top here um, are the connection dialogues here, first of all, for those of you that are trying, looking at your vessel, trying to figure out how to connect to our game. <laughs> these, these arrows <laughs> will bring up the connection dialogue and allow you to find games once you connect to the vessel server using this connection uh, button right here. Uh, then we have the counter tray. Now, most of the counters get pre-populated when you start a scenario, so you don't have to worry about setup. And trust me, for games like this with two maps and lots of small counters, it saves you an hour and a half. So uh, that helps. However, there will be ne some necessary markers. A lot of markers that you need, you can usually get through the right-click menu. However, there are times when you will need a control marker or you'll need to uh, come up with, uh, what is it that I usually grab over here? Uh, miners, when you're looking to populate, uh, and we'll get into that, I suppose, as we go through diplomacy, uh, bringing in other nations. Um, there are a couple of different tracks here. Some of these more faithfully recreate the player aids. So this national track dialogue pretty faithfully recreates um, the uh, production tracks, the factories, and the national world tracks from the printed game, uh, as does the faction card here. Helps you through each uh, uh, player's production queue. Um, but within the module, the Axis faction card, the Soviet faction card, and the Western faction card are kind of uh, uh, really conveniently uh, grouped sets of uh, um, tracks and uh, production queues. And I, I don't have the physical copy in front of me, Sal. Are um, the faction cards in, in the print game uh, identical to these here? Yes. Okay, great. So. Um, uh, you often in playing on by email or playing online, you will live out of uh, those trays. And um, then going to, uh, we've got the Diplomacy Cup, which we'll get into as we need to pull Diplomacy. Uh, combat Commitment, which is a little optional window here to help you with uh, aspects of the combat system when playing by email. A turn track, and uh, again for most players, uh, sometimes these aren't shown as docked in the bar. But with many, many, many Vassal modules, if you go into the Preferences menu, you will find a Turn Counter pane, and you can request that it gets docked into the toolbar, which I will frequently do. A couple uh, dice rolls for 1d6, 2d6, or 3d6. The weather tracks uh, to keep track of how weather's going. And then, very importantly here, you've got the CRT, which in this version defaults to a very close zoom in. Uh, so the Combat Results table. Uh, and the player aid card, which will uh, be useful for a, a great many parts of this game. Um, and uh, I imagine once we get into combat, we'll have a chance to get some uh, insight on that CRT. And then finally, the turn track, uh, if you don't want to use the, uh, in the module, if you're not using the one on the board. Okay, so that is the whirlwind tour of the module. If anyone has any questions, feel free to throw that out. Um, pending any questions. I guess we will uh, start going through the SOP. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so the uh, sequence of play starts with the uh, weather phase. The game does come with a sequence of play flowchart, both for the entire turn and the uh, operations uh, phase. Okay. And so in the uh, weather phase, uh, you simply uh, roll three dice. There are three weather zones uh, in unconditional surrender. Uh, sorry, there are four zones. You only roll for three. It's always uh, pretty in the desert. <laughs> uh, and on the map, if you go quickly, you'll see a small uh, dotted line. Uh, they're, they're blue, green, and yellow, and each representing different zones. So if you want, you can just roll three dice in a row. Now, we're in September. This is September 39. So if you look on the track, you'll see uh, month. Oh, sorry, I'm at the uh, weather table. Oh, uh, yep. Uh, I so see. On the player, I see. Play Bobby Factor just figured out that he can change the turn. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So on the, on the player aid card... Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you go to the player aid card you, and look at the weather, if you look under months, you'll see uh, 
July through September. And the weather is good. And uh, you roll 1d6 one, one for each weather zone. Uh, and you just look up the result. And for July through September, those are the always fair weather turns. So across the entire map, it's, uh, it's good. All right. Good time to attack the Russians. Got it. Okay. Right. So weather stays good then for us? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, next is the declare war phase, uh, which you only worry about in certain scenarios, but the larger campaign ones. Uh, now, if for those who are unfamiliar with uh, unconditional surrender, uh, unlike other games where um, one side goes and does everything, um, in they complete their whole turn, and then the other side goes through the entire sequence of play uh, for their turn. In Unconditional Surrender, you go, every faction participates in each phase at that time. Uh, there are a few exceptions. So for the weather phase, only the Axis player or A player needs to roll for weather for the map. So in the Declare War phase, uh, first the Axis faction will declare war uh, on any countries that, that are neutral. Uh, then that's followed by the Western faction and then the Soviet faction. Uh, this is the, uh, in the campaign game, here's a discussion on politics. In a campaign game, there are policies that are in effect at the beginning of the game. Uh, there are appeasement, which affects the Axis and Western factions. And then there's a Nazi, Nazi Soviet pact, which affects the Axis and Soviet factions. Mm -hmm. uh, while those policies are in effect, uh, you can't, the allies cannot declare war, uh, and uh, the Axis can declare war on minor countries, but the other thing those policies do is they prevent these factions from attacking each other. So, in our particular case, appeasement is in effect. And we want to use. We want to play an historical game. Mm -hmm. So, the Axis player needs to first declare war against the Western faction. Right. And that then breaks the appeasement policy, which then allows the Axis player uh, to attack Western allied countries. And if I recall correctly, there's a status marker for uh, these, some of these very important policies that are in effect and when they might lapse. Is that correct? Uh, there are no markers here. Oh, I see. That, uh, actually, Totala Creek has those markers. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, actually, that's been a suggestion. Some people have said, well, it would be nice to have. But um, there are only two major policies in effect. So sure. um, there are other conditional events that can occur. But I don't know necessarily need a marker. Right. And anyway, um, go ahead. no, that's okay. So neutral. So Poland is neutral at the beginning of the game, like any other country. Uh, we've, the, in terms of setup, we've set up its counters in the historical uh, setup, uh, just to give people a frame of reference. Uh, there's nothing that says the Axis player has to declare war on Poland. There's nothing that says they have to declare war on anybody at the beginning of the game. Play connect them. Mm -hmm. So we, we were discussing um, activating uh, the Polish on one of the Allies' sides. Right, that's correct. Mm. So, uh, so we've declared war on the Western faction. Uh, we then declare war on Poland. And because the Western faction is at war, mm -hmm. uh, Poland will join the Western faction automatically. Uh, the game allows you to go in the opposite direction if you wanted to. The Allied, the Axis player could instead declare war on the Soviet faction, and then if it declared war on Poland, it would uh, join the Soviet faction. Side with the Polish, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so. And so uh, now that uh, Poland has been activated and is on the western side. Um, I populate them, uh, their counters on my uh, faction card here. Um, what is their initial uh, production and what is their initial will? Okay, so uh, their production is equal to their, uh, the number of factories they have. So you'll put 
well, to start with, you, we, we're not actually in the economy phase. Oh, so okay. what we do is we take the production times two marker, mm -hmm. put it in the uh, production multiplier. Okay. And then take the production one counter and put it in the zero. And you're good. Okay. And I still see them on the map on my end. Did you move them, or oh, did you actually create I, them? I didn't see that they were on the map. I, I, was, yeah. I, I spawned them from the tray. Ah, Let me delete okay. those. Helpfully placed for me on the map. There we go. Mm -hmm. and there we go. Okay. I'm with you. Yep. And then their uh, national will is six. I'm oh, sorry. Listen to me. 12. <laughs> 12, got it. Yeah. And that's just a representation of the country's willingness to fight and when they capitulate? Yes, every, every country has a national will, uh, and as they lose uh, uh, field armies, those are two-step armies, or they lose their home cities, uh, mm -hmm. their national will will drop. When it drops to zero, that country will collapse. If the country collapses and at least one of its cities is enemy occupied, then the country is conquered. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few exceptions with uh, England and UK and and Russia and this United States. Okay. And every country is affected in the same way. Okay. All right. So war has been declared. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Uh, with the Nazi-Soviet pact still in effect, then the uh, Allies are not able to declare war. So then we're done with the declare war phase, and we then go to the economy phase. Okay. Uh, and the economy uh, system in unconditional surrender tries to be fairly straightforward. So every country will have one or more uh, factory cities, or just factories, if you will. Uh, if you look on the map, you simply count how many are in your home country and are friendly to you. Okay. Uh, so we can uh, start with the uh, axis and we'll start with Germany. Okay. Yeah. We got the card up. Yep. Uh, and uh, if we were to take away all the counters on the map and count the number of factories within German borders, there would be uh, 13. Okay, and that's the little globe button here for folks in Basel. It removes all counters. Yep. Okay. Um, and uh, if you look at a Soviet, uh, in the Soviet, the Axis faction card, you will see that there's an on-map factory count track. Yep. Uh, and on that track, you'll see there's a factory count marker that's already sitting in the 13 box. Okay. For the larger countries, they have this little marker, and it just makes it easier for players to uh, track where they're, they're at, so they don't have to keep counting 13 or 10 or 12. Um, a country like Poland, which is very small, or Hungary, they don't have a, a marker because it's very easy to see uh, at a glance what they have. Right. So, it, in Unconditional Surrender, you get one production point per friendly factory in your home country and a few countries get to multiply that by two Germany is one of them uh, and you can look in the Axis production track on the card and you'll see a production multiplier box and you'll see it says Germany times two so in this particular case Germany has 13 factories multiply by two they'll have 26 production points Okay. So if you just want to move the markers, you won't need to. I'll go for it, and I'll let you uh, push axis. Okay. And I will retreat gallantly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, production drives just about everything in the game. You need it to move uh, land units. You need to recover air and naval units. You need it for diplomacy. You need it for replacements. You need it to mobilize. Uh, 26 uh, is fairly typical f for most of the game for uh, Germany. It will go up a little bit. Um, but uh, in the game, uh, I 
wanted to avoid uh, accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, all the numbers are, are very small generally. Okay. Right. So that's the axis. We're going to go to the western faction. And so here I'm going to have a couple of nations to keep track of. And at this point, uh, UK, France, and the Poles are all times two. And I'll mm -hmm. go ahead and leverage the uh, factory count markers on the board for um, the France, French and the UK. So I see I have eight French production, I'm sorry, factories, which mm -hmm. would then equate to 16 production. Uh, nine UK factories for 18 production. And then as we had gone over in Poland, I believe you said it was uh, it, six. They actually have they have three, three factories. I got it. Three factories. Yep, um, doubled to six. And one thing here to note on the map, right. folks, is this red dashed line within Poland is uh, doesn't take into account here. The national border is the black dashed line. Right. Now, um, this is what you have here in the vassal module, um, mm -hmm. and. Poland is listed at two times two. Uh, recent errata has removed the production two marker. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, if you want, you well, can leave it just nope. to show what it's like. Um, Poland may not even survive the turn, so it may not matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, um, let, let's go ahead and uh, play current with the recent errata, although the game mm -hmm. is certainly playable uh, with all stages of the rules. Um, yes. Uh, this would certainly explain just why my opponent held so begrudgingly to life as Poland for like three months. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, well rules. done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if they can survive the initial onslaught, then poor weather tends to make them. <laughs> okay. So uh, three production Tougher. for the poles. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. Uh, all right. And, all right. Uh, hey, um, Gummator, if uh, you can, I'm not 100% sure that everyone on is able to get on the Skype call. So if you could hop on and just let me know that you can hear me, that'd be great. I'm there. I can hear you. All right. Perfect. Oh, I just used to be good. Okay. Yeah, we have a couple people that joined early before I joined. I that was my mistake. Uh, apologies, everyone. So if you can go ahead and join back to the call, I we have proof that it works. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, feel free to interject with questions when you have them. All right, Alex. Sure. All right. All right. All right. And that's the uh, Western faction and the Soviet faction. Uh, even though uh, it's currently not at war, it is an active country, and so uh, it does participate to some degree. Okay. And so we'll do its production. Excellent. And I see they have nine on the factory count, so we'll go ahead and, go ahead and give them the 18. And this is largely going to be used to uh, scoot uh, armies around in preparation for hostilities. Uh, yes. Uh, early on, it's, it's mostly uh, diplomacy. Oh, okay. uh, you'll you'll quickly find that in, early in the game you have more production points than you need. Um, one of the things that's different uh, in unconditional surrender, though, is that your production points are use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. So you're not accumulating turn after turn. It's another thing that keeps the game uh, simple in that regard. Then it also avoids um, massing an unusually a large number of production points, and then. You know, conducting activities that go you know, beyond reason. And I find that that did, in my playthroughs, tend as a player to try and encourage me to plan ahead for the turn and try and back out and keep a reserve of the production that I would want for subsequent activities, whether that would be replenishing an air or naval unit or uh, conducting diplomacy, um, and that there would mm -hmm. be on map movements that I would then, uh, that I would then hold off on. All right, and so at this point, um, uh, strategic war doesn't happen. Is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have strategic movement. So if we look at the Axis faction card, you will see 
that there is a strategic move marker. Okay. And that's something I guess you can show on Twitch if you wish. Yep, I've got it up. Yep. So uh, you can place this marker on uh, any air or naval unit mm -hmm. that's in supply. And for example, I'll just, uh, and it also needs to be on a rail line. Okay. Or, or a road. There's no functional difference between the two of them in uh, in the game. You know, so you just place it on there and then you can move that uh, unit an unlimited amount of distance along the rail or road line or transport line as the game calls it. Mm -hmm. uh, the one you have, your restriction is that it cannot enter an enemy zone of control okay. or an enemy city. He can start there but he can't end there. I see. So, uh, I'm not going to be uh, sure. Doing any strategic movement. Um, flipping through to, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, the mm -hmm. Western Allies, um, one could, f um, but um, there's really not a lot of incentive at this point, too, since I don't know how the map is shaping. Uh, right, yes. And then the Ruskies here, or the Russians, um, also, but again, we'll leave it uh, and let the first turn play out. Right. Yeah, and there are some, uh, there are some restrictions that are, exist in the campaign game. For example, if you look at uh, Leningrad, uh, mm -hmm. you'll see that there's a, there's a fort, and under the fort there's a ground unit. And uh, one of the restrictions early in the game, in the campaign game, is that you're not allowed to move those guys out of Leningrad. And that's to keep players from doing a historical behavior that might, in a game sense, be more "quote unquote" optimal. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. It also, in this particular case, helps them to avoid a mistake, because <laughs> it's very easy <laughs> sometimes to uh, forget that you left that unoccupied, and all of a sudden. Uh, the Germans walk in. Right, Army Group North has a brilliant success. Yeah. All right, uh, and so now we're actually kind of into uh, the meat and potatoes of the core system here, or the core mm -hmm. game, uh, which is the operation phase. And for those of you that have been following the discussion on Reddit, um, you, you may know that I have uh, no uh, uh, secret of my uh, adoration of Case Blue, the variant of this included in uh, RBM Studios' C3i magazine as just being a, uh, a tremendous uh, magazine game. Um, really, in case blue, that scenario, um, this is the, the part of the game that that uh, uh, game focuses on. You know, it streamlines uh, everything down to just the operation phase, uh, more or less. And so this is, for those of you that have case blue but not unconditional surrender uh, box game, uh, this is where you're going to be uh, spending most of your time. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so the uh, the war begins. Yes, so uh, as with every other phase in the game, the uh, Axis player will conduct his operations phase, followed by the Western faction, followed by the Soviet faction. All right, in, uh, in the game, uh, units uh, activate to perform actions, and unlike most games where one side moves all of its units and does all of its combat uh, and then finishes the rest of its turn and continues in the game uh, what you do is you activate one unit you perform actions with it until either you decide to end its actions or uh, it runs out of movement points so it creates a bit of a fog of war because you say you activate the first panzer army and you conduct operations with it uh, you don't necessarily know if your the plans that you had for the fourth army uh, which is going to you know sort of cover its flank if it's going to be able to uh, do what it, you were hoping it would do mm -hmm. it creates a bit of uh, tension and fog of war so 
if we're looking at our map and we look at Poland, we know Poland has 12 national will in the game. Uh, if we open up the player aid card mm -hmm. and use scroll but, down to where you see national will effects. That's the yellow uh, heading here for those of you looking mm -hmm. at your card. First line you'll see is to a country. Each time one of its field ground units is eliminated while defending in combat, it will lose one national will. Okay. A field ground unit is a two-sided uh, infantry or, or armored unit. Okay. We can skip the next line and we go on to the third line where you see it says minus two to a country each time one of its mainland cities except its capital becomes enemy controlled. So losing a city is going to cost two national will. And then the line under that is minus four if a country loses its capital. And so we see that right off the bat here, Poland is at risk for, for uh, a couple of cities that are within two hexes and lightly defended. Three cities, four cities within two hexes of Ger the Germans and uh, a comparable number of units. So we can, well, there are several ways we can uh, approach trying to uh, attack Poland. Um, I will uh, just proceed uh, with sort of straightforward uh, approach. Um, there's no necessarily an optimal way to do this uh, because you don't necessarily know, again, how some combats will, will play out. All right. Uh, so we'll start with uh, activating the 4th Army. And if we go to the, back to the player aid card, and the top right you'll see production. Someone has a lovely dog. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so you will see in the production uh, table there that to activate a ground unit will either cost you one movement, one production point, or two production points. One if it's a leg unit, uh, two if it's a mobile unit. Okay. Uh, that same one or two production point cost is the same that you would pay for giving those units replacement. Okay. It's the same production points that you would pay for mobilizing brand new units. Okay. I, I tried to make the game. Uh, user friendly in that regard by trying to stay consistent in, in costs across the aspects of the game. Uh, so this uh, is a regular infantry unit, so it's considered a leg unit. So it's going to cost one production point to activate it. Okay. So if you want to go uh, so people can see it on your sure, end. Sure. And, so um, I will uh, pay the production Mm -hmm. and activate the unit. When, when you're activating them on the table, of course, just keep track of what you've activated. The Vassal module has a handy uh, unit overlay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So in the game, uh, there are two movement point allowances to remember, 8 and 10. Uh, 8 if you're a leg unit, and 10 if you're any other kind of unit. So this is a leg unit, so it has eight movement points altogether uh, for the turn. And it will move and fight and continue to do so until it runs out of movement points or you decide to end its activation or something forces it to end its activation. Okay. And for those of you looking at the paper game, there's a couple of tracks uh, on the map. Uh, what, uh, whatever is convenient to you uh, when you're playing to, to keep track of those. Uh, often when playing online, it's best to maybe just keep track of it in the text field uh, here in the Vassal model. Something else you can do in the Vassal module is also uh, lay down sortie markers to indicate movement points. Oh, I see. Oh, that's good. I didn't consider that. All right. Uh, I'm going to uh, take the 4th Army, and we are going to uh, move in directly east. 
Uh, and uh, your movement point costs are fairly straightforward on the map. It's one for clear, two if it's some kind of uh, terrain within the hex, uh, plus one for crossing uh, a river or mountain hex side. Okay. So that was one movement point. Now I want to attack uh, the, the army directly to the east. Mm hmm. So, to do, attack the army directly to the east, uh, first I pay the amount of movement points it costs to enter the hex. I don't actually move into it yet, but I do pay all the movement point costs. So in this particular case, it's one because it's a clear hex, another one because I'm crossing over a river. So that's two movement points. And then, if we look at the player A card, yep. And we look at the movement table. You'll find that attacking a unit in a hex affected by fair weather down near the bottom of the ground movement is, it is an additional uh, movement plus one. Okay. In the game, if you attack, you're going to move less distance. Okay, that makes sense. And so in this particular case, we've spent three more movement points. Uh, to launch a mobile attack, what we call a mobile attack, against the Polish army. Okay. Uh, so we've spent four altogether. Okay. And uh, now we conduct our combat. All right. So if we want to bring up the CRT yep. player eight card. The one CRT to rule them all. Yes, <laughs> that's oh. correct. Uh, yes, the game uses one combat results table to resolve every type of combat. Ground, air, naval, and strategic. You do have uh, differences in, in what they are, what the results are, but it is one table. And yeah. it uses the same combat sequence uh, as well for all the different types of combats. And I have to say, the, the, uh, how congruous this uh, these combat systems were in all channeling through this this same process and being able to use the CRT was kind of one of the most impressive things to me as a, as a new player coming to learn this system uh, was this uh, a design goal from the beginning or um, was there no, an inspiration or a region or a reason for this design uh, aspect uh, I simplicity I think more than anything else mm -hmm. um, I wanted to see if I could create a system uh, that allowed me to go to one table. It was somewhat inspired by an old task force game called Liddell Hart's um, History of the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, which used this sort of single unit activation and then uh, a series of tables, but they were sort of similar okay. for all the different areas. Um, it wasn't quite as, you know, down to one table like this was, but uh, that, that's what I attempted to do, and it seems to have worked. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, it certainly has. Okay, so we're now, we're now into uh, the combat seg uh, segment for these two units. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the way combat works uh, is um, if you look at the combat resolution sequence, which is on the card to the right of the CRT itself, you have a, a, a six-step process. Um, unless you're doing ground combat, you often skip two of those steps. Um, basically, there are two types of combat in the game, uh, mobile and assault. Um, this is a mobile attack, so we don't have to worry about declaring a primary attacker. There is only one attacker. Mm-hmm. You then, uh, each side then makes a decision as to whether it will or will not commit uh, additional event markers to influence the combat. If we, uh, for sake of brevity, I can tell you that the Axis have no markers that they could apply in this particular case. Uh, event markers. Mm -hmm. They do have air that they could commit to support the battle. The Western faction, if we open up their faction card, yep. the 
Poles, the, the Polish troops do not have any air units that they commit, but the Western faction does have what are called ground support markers. Mm -hmm. And you can commit one of those in the ground combat. And so in this case, actually, it wouldn't be a terrible scenario for either side to try uh, to have a commitment of some sort attacking with the leg unit over the river hex, which intuitively for most players, we, we think that that would incur some penalty to attack across the river. Um, the Germans maybe could use a little push, and the Poles, given a little bit of propping, might be able to to hold. So, mm -hmm. so both players here at this point, um, with this lead, potentially are considering a commitment. Yes, and the the will commit will not commit in the game is uh, done secretly. Mm -hmm. uh, there are markers uh, that come with the game. It is the one time in the game where. Um, you know, the, people aren't seeing what the other person is doing mm -hmm. and in the vassal module there is a combat commitment track mm -hmm. uh, little tables so click on that and then you'll see uh, will commit uh, on both sides there if you flip one of those markers over it'll, it'll say will not commit mm -hmm. and then in vassal you can also keep these hidden right and then you drag it to when ready, and then you reveal. So, and then you reveal your simultaneously whether you're going to commit or not commit. And when that happens, if one side or both sides say they will not commit, then they cannot commit at all, no matter what the other side does. Right. If you indicate that you will commit, then you must make at least one commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, it's just uh, back and forth until both sides pass. Okay, and so for instance, uh, with this combat, um, I've pulled up the combat commitment window and I've hidden the defender chit, uh, mm -hmm. so I you won't see my commitment. Uh, and although, of course, those of you watching the stream <laughs> can see my commitment, uh, and um, I have gone ahead and made my decision. Now, presumably, you would do the same as well as the attacker. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so. Okay, and so that's what you'll see. Um, for those of you playing by email, this is just as easily accomplished um, by putting blank log entries in. And, and that way, every player makes the decision without knowing what the other player has done. Okay, and so we both committed, and we, I revealed, or at least mine. Let's see, yours did not reveal when I did that. Oh, there it is, all right. Okay, so... Um, both sides are committing to this combat. Yes. Um, so, uh, the, the Germans, uh, if you'll, you'll see on the map, that there are several air units. Uh, oh, and for those, again, who are not familiar with the game, the game has very simple stacking rules. It's one of each type of unit. Uh, so, one ground unit, uh, one air unit. Or one naval. Or, well, one naval by type, so you could sure. have up to one warship unit and up to one convoy unit. So the attacker always starts the commitment process. So it, in this case, the Axis player would say, well, I'm committing an air unit right. for air support. And then, and then the Alec Poles would commit ground support. Right. And now if the Axis had something else that they could commit, they could either say I'm going to commit this, or they could say I'm not going to commit. And then, then the allied player can decide, uh, I'll also I'll commit this other thing, or, or they won't. Sure. Um, but what ends up happening is if, you're, if both sides put down a will commit down, and it, the other side commits something, then the other player can always add something else in. If, assuming they have something available, sure. Even if they've passed before. Okay. And from a, a player perspective, you have fewer bag of things in your bag of tricks than potential combats in a round. So, so oh, yes. you will want to be very judicious in your uh, uh, commitments uh, and pick your battle. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 So um, back to the CRT then. Yeah. Okay. So. Back to CRT, 
we've now done step two, which is we uh, commit uh, extra support to the battle. Um, we uh, step three is only takes place if both sides committed air in support of the battle. So that's not the case in this situation. So we skip step three. Okay. Step four, each side now determines its own specific die roll modifiers. Okay. And, and unlike in a lot of other games, each side keeps its own modifiers. It, you do not net them into one modifier that goes to one side or the other. Okay. okay. So if we look at the... We'll start with the attacker. Uh, and we look at the ground combat DRM table. Right. Uh, so this is a mobile attack. So you'll see a listing of modifiers. Uh, at first, this seems somewhat daunting, but after a few combats, it will become pretty, pretty straightforward. And you'll remember a lot of these. Yeah, m most of these. Once you have a couple of these under your belt, um, you don't even look at the table. You just know, okay, I got a tank, it's a river, it's a city, go. Yes, and, and again, uh, if you'll look, you'll see fairly straightforward modifiers, simplistic, uh, plus one, plus twos, minus ones, minus twos. You don't... Uh, that. It's just easier to remember that way. Sure, absolutely. Uh, in this particular case, we have uh, a German infantry army. So since it's a German unit, um, it's uh, plus two to start with. Uh, there is a track on the map uh, that allows you to keep track of it in case it gets too, too much. Um, we can skip through the next ones. The next modifier that will uh, come into effect on that DRM listing will be a tank unit that is either defending or attacking a unit in a hex affected by fair weather. Uh, I'm sorry, that doesn't apply in this case because it's an infantry unit. Uh, I was thinking of the Panzer Army. But it certainly yeah. will come up frequently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, there, the defender is not isolated. We don't have to worry about that. The nope. weather is fine. Um, the hex that the Polish army is actually in is in clear. Yep. So that is no problem. But you do have the river. Um, but you are attacking across the river hex side, so there's a minus one. We committed air to the battle, and so we'll see uh, air support from an air unit, and the defender's hex is affected by fair weather. You'll see a plus two. Got it. So netting those together, we're looking at a three die roll modifier for the attacker. Yes. And um, since we talked about the air unit briefly, if you would, just place a sorties marker, a, a one sorties marker. Yep. I guess I could do that. There we go. I got it. I got that up. You got it. Yep. Yep. And so we'll, we'll cover I, that. We'll, we'll cover that later. Yep. Uh, after this combat, we'll talk about that briefly. So the Germans are at plus three. If we look at uh, that table, that DRM table, mm -hmm. I can tell you that uh, nothing is going to apply. With the exception uh, of my commitment, my one marker. Yes, if you go all the way down that, that path down there, that table, you'll eventually see committed event marker. Yep. And then if you flip over your ground support marker, you see on the back it will indicate a ground combat or ground plus one. Yep, so I'll go ahead and give myself the plus one DRM. And again, this gets to be fairly intuitive after you do a couple of them. So, okay, so that's been committed. Uh, we now are at step five of the combat resolution sequence. Yep. It's very simple. Each side rolls a die and adds its... And, and uh, you cut out there, but... It's it the uh, roll for the Axis player. Okay. I rolled a one. I like that it's roll. not good for an attacker. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, mod then modified by three, that would, when we read this, we'll put him on the four column for those of you looking. Yes. And then mm -hmm. as the defender, I'll also roll a one. Uh, okay. So my net result is two. Yeah. So if you look on the CRT, the combat results table, you will go across the right for the attacker's value, and then scroll down to the defender's value. 
which uh, nets yeah. us. To choose defender, and you get a. Go ahead. No, so you'll end up with uh, right a four to two, which is uh, a dr plus two result. So again, each person keeps their own modifiers. It's important to remember. So on the combat results table, this again handles all different types of combat. For ground combat, you always ignore those plus a number results. All you're worried about are the letters. So if we go uh, look a little to the right of the combat results table, the ground combat theorem, you'll see ground combat results. The very first thing it tells you is important. For all results, ignore the plus number part of the CRT. <laughs> And we see for DR, I must retreat. Right. Uh, and retreats in the game are very simple. It's always one hex. Got it. And the prohibitions are listed there for reference right below the results. But in general, um, uh, I got to uh, go away from the unit that attacked me and not into an EZOC generally. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I have such a hex available to me where my ground support marker happens to be. So I will go ahead and push there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, I suppose I'll go ahead and resolve where this goes. Uh, this particular marker has a die icon on it, which means that uh, it then gets placed uh, 1d6 number of turns forward on the turn track. So I'll go ahead and figure out where this goes. Two turns. Okay, so where are we? We are in uh, September, so I'll see it again in November. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. No. So uh, while we're also there, uh, well, well yep. that's, no, that's okay. I'm just going to talk about sorties, but I'll wait until this activation is over. Sure. All right. So uh, if we recall and if we look, the German Fourth Army has expended four of its eight movement points that it gets this turn. Um, it has an option here to either advance after combat into the hex vacated by the defender, which would not cost any additional movement points. It already paid to do all that movement when it attacked. Alternatively, it can choose not to advance after combat and then can just continue moving, uh, mm -hmm. possibly going into a different hex. So... I am going to not advance after combat because I want to do something in particular here. Okay. Uh, I will uh, move instead to uh, the southeast and uh, now in the game oh. Ezox, enemy zones of control are very very sticky. I just see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. um, so in the game if uh, once you enter an enemy zone of control you have one of two options you either end the unit's activation or you attack something that it's adjacent to mm -hmm. in this particular case I now have uh, spent five movement points I have three remaining. Um, I either end this unit's activation or uh, I have to attack something. Uh, I don't have enough movement points to attack the Posenan army. Because if you uh, slide the, that out of the way, you'll see that there's a city under there. Right here in Posen? Mm hmm. And so, given that there's a city... Those yeah, given there's a city, I'm not going to have enough movement points to attack it, because an enemy city costs two movement points to, attack, to enter. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lose one for going across the river. That's, another, that's three right there. Right. And if we recall, attacking costs you additional movement point in fair weather. So that would cost me four to attack that location, and I only have three remaining. So then However, your only option is to attack the retreated army. Yes, if I chose to attack, which which I'll do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Right, and okay. we can uh, kind of speed through commitments a little bit. Having only <laughs> one remaining commitment available for the polls um, <laughs> this turn or next turn. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I'm probably going to save this. For the river, plus two more for air support in fair weather. Polish Army this time will have no modified air again for air support. Okay. Um, and I'll use the same air unit. So I'll just bump it up to two sorties. Uh, and we'll talk about those sorties uh, in a minute. Uh, it's three moving. One for the attack, one for crossing the river, one for the attack itself. Okay, just as we had before. My motto. Same modifiers as before for the Germans, which is uh, plus three total, plus two for German, minus one for the river, plus two more for air support in fair weather. Polish Army this time will have no modifiers because it doesn't have a ground support marker. Right. So we each roll a die. Okay. So six to one is not going to be pretty. Uh, right. So we look at six to one, and we'll see that it's a DD plus three. It's crown combat, so we ignore that plus three. And we look up DD, and a DD uh, is defender disrupted. The first thing that you do when a, when a defender is disrupted is that uh, you take away a step. Um, if you look at the ground units, uh, you'll see that there are... Um, Two types of ground units, uh, one that has uh, you know, your standard NATO symbols, tank, infantry, um, and those have two steps. Uh, and then there are what I call garrison armies. Those are armies that simply have a rectangle box for their NATO symbol, and they only have, they're only considered reduced and only basically have one step. And so these are all generally rear guard, militia, just not... Frontline fighting forces. Right. Okay. Or they could represent uh, just not a large number of troops. Sure, sure. Um, and uh, so you, when you're def disrupted, you take a step loss, and then you must retreat. Okay. And Again, I'm cannot... looking real quick to make sure I can retreat across a river. <laughs> yes, you can. Which is good in my case. Since uh, every other place I could retreat is in an uh, enemy zone of control. Yeah. So the retreat has been completed. Mm -hmm. right. uh, again, I can choose to advance after combat if I wanted to. But in, this particular, to. <laughs> I, in this particular case, I'm going to not do that. And I'll exp we'll explain why in a minute. Uh, I have spent uh, all of this unit's uh, movement points, so it is now done for the turn. All right, and that's how an activation runs with mobile attacks here. Just mm -hmm. uh, activate, you get your budget of movement points, you move, attack, move, attack, uh, as you see fit, until you have uh, are done or you've consumed your, your allotment, and then you move on to the next unit, having had the knowledge on how that all went. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Now, before I continue on with the next unit I'm going to activate, I just want to quickly ask if anybody had any questions. Yeah, how's uh, this sticking for you, Commander? So far, so good. Yeah, we have this pretty nice. Sorry, muted. Sorry, forgot to. Oh, no problem. All right. Uh, anyone in Vassal uh, with a question so far? Feel free to type it. Those of you mm -hmm. who are on Twitch, hopefully you can be on the Vassal or the <laughs> Skype stream as well. Um, I suppose with that, actually, we've been going for about an hour, so why don't we take um, uh, you know, uh, three or four minutes here, uh, and people can freshen up their beverages, use the restroom, uh, and we'll hop uh, right back in and uh, roll through a couple of combats here and go into what is going to be a disastrous turn here for... Uh, uh, well, yeah, I think we'll, <laughs> because of the pace of this, um, what yeah. we'll probably do is I'll run through another ground unit activation, talk about yep. air units, and then we'll just roll right to diplomacy. diplomacy. Great. Um, 
Okay, so then, folks, uh, after after the break, um, we'll uh, do uh, another ground combat or two, and then go into diplomacy and uh, talk about uh, other aspects of the game. So, uh, uh, come back here and uh, um, join us. How again. much? How much time? Uh, how much time would you like? Oh, I'm I'm fine. So it doesn't matter. You you pick it. You're okay. It's, this is your ball. Uh, let's just go with three <laughs> minutes. People can stretch their legs and get a beer. Okay, sounds right. good. Yeah. Okay, folks, uh, thanks for uh, sticking with us through the break. Hopefully you have a nice, refreshing uh, beverage with you at this point, and we can uh, get back into it. So we had just finished one unit activation and gone through a couple of uh, attacks, some retreats, um, and a couple activate and a couple uh, commitments. So, uh, Sal, what, what else did you have in store for me in this attack? Okay, so at this point, um, I'm going to activate the German 8th Army, which is southwest of Posen. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's going to cost me one production point, one German production point to do that. And it then also gets eight movement points. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's on the clock. Yep. All right. Uh, so uh, this will give me an opportunity to talk about uh, enemy zones of control and how sticky they are. So I said that if you ever enter an enemy zone of control, you have two options, either end activation or attack. At the beginning of a turn, uh, 
if you start in an enemy zone of control, you have the option of attacking right away or moving out of that zone of control, enemy zone of control, into an, another one. Uh, but importantly, not of, not directly from one enemy zone of control into another one that's exerted by the same unit. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to switch over to the Twitch. So, if you would, um, mm -hmm. uh, if you would take the Eighth Army, and if you want to uh, blow up your um, zoom in a little bit so that people can see sure. the numbers. Let me uh, unactivate this guy so it's clear. So here's eight, and here's four. Okay. Uh, so, all right. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, if you would take the German Eighth Army, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it is allowed to move into 2730, which is directly to the west, and then from there could move into, say, 2630. Okay. That would end up costing four movement points altogether. That's not what I'm going to do, uh, but that would be an allowed movement. Now, once it moved into 2630, it has entered an enemy zone of control, and, it uh, must. and therefore must... Right. You, got that. you got it. Either stop or attack. <laughs> okay. Now, what it's not allowed to do, what a unit cannot do, is it cannot start in 2731 and move directly into 2630. Because that, those are both hexes with control exerted by the pole. Yes, the same exact unit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because the game has a very low counter density, uh, the very sticky zones of enemy zones of control uh, allow and prevent or prevents the players from you know taking advantage of low counter density and, and maneuvering around units uh, right. too easily. And let's think about this philosophically here for for the people listening. Uh, those are four X's on top of these counters. These these aren't even divisions that have maybe some liberty of movement within their scale. These these uh, these are complete armies, multiple cores within yeah. them, multiple divisions within the cores. What is the, uh, I know it, it varies based on the map distortion, but what's the uh, stated uh, hex width? Um, uh, 35 miles. Exactly. So it's About a 50 kilometers. It's a fairly abstract concept here of, of where the mass of a formation is, but then where it is also able to exert a combat effect. So um, uh, unlike yeah. maybe an operational scale game where there's a lot more fluidity, um, this this uh, it really makes sense to me at least on on why these things are are, are so sticky. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now if if you want to just take the second pans and just move them over to Breslau briefly. Sure. Uh, now uh, you could, if this were the map situation, you could take the Eighth Army and go from twenty seven thirty one into twenty eight thirty one as the very first thing that you do mm -hmm. because those are two different enemy zones of control from two different units and you're, so you're not violating that rule which says you can't go from one to the other of the same unit okay now once you got into 2831 you've entered an enemy zone of control it's stop or fight right uh, so if we would reset here to four uh, also your friendly units do not negate zones of control for purposes of movement because you're not allowed to uh, overstack you could not for sake of argument uh, take the 8th army move on top of the 1st panzer and then move somewhere else right that, uh, because, that, okay. that's not legal yep that's not legal Okay. alright so I will start I'll activate the 8th army we've paid uh, our production point for that I am now going to directly attack an army, causing an army, and uh, it's two movement points because it's an enemy city, and one movement point because I'm attacking in fair weather. Okay. Uh, so that's three movement points out of uh, eight total. Okay. Uh, 
we can uh, go through the commitment process again. Um, sure. Again, the will commit, will not commit would be hidden uh, for sake of uh, speed. I'll just say I'm going to commit an air unit. And I uh, will not commit my one remaining unit. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case, I'm going to take the uh, air unit, the fourth Luftwaffe, um, which is to the south, and commit from there. Okay. Um, and uh, for people who are not aware, uh, the range of an air unit to support an, a land battle, or to provide air support as the game calls it, uh, is a five hex range. If you were to look on the player aid card. And that's listed and, in movement, is it? Uh, ranges are listed in the ranges table, which is in the to the bottom right. Oh, I see. Here with the uh, lavender. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's an often forgot table. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and but like like so many other things in this game, the numbers are, are so small and, and fairly consistent. Um, mm -hmm. So so five is pretty easy to remember once you get going. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, I'll throw a sortie on the. Uh, Rich, for those of you playing at home, place marker is your place for these. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll now go through the modifiers. And uh, without looking, I can tell you we're, uh, if it's a German unit, it gets a plus two. Yep. German ground unit gets a plus two. Um, it is attacking into an enemy city, so that's a minus one. And then it has air support in fair weather. It's another plus two. So the German, again, is a plus three. Uh, right, but in this case... no. Uh, right. In this case, very good. No, I'm glad you caught it. In this case... There's something special going on here. The Poznan army is considered isolated. And a unit is considered isolated if it has no eligible retreat path and it is not adjacent to a friendly unit or city. And this goes to show you how the reason why I took the 4th army and moved the way I did was to isolate this army. That's right. So every place this guy could have retreated is in an enemy zone of control. So there's there's no eligible retreat. I don't have any uh, buddies. If somehow this unit had been able to uh, end its retreat here, that would have broken isolation. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Right. Yeah. Is isolation in the game has nothing to do with supply. Um, it has nothing to do with whether you're in a city or out of city. It has to do with whether you have no retreat path and you are not adjacent to a friendly city or um, or army. You know, the whole idea is if you're if you're next to something friendly, then there's some kind of hope, some kind of support, some place to run, etc. And so, um, adding all those together here, you are now at a plus five. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of you getting a chance to play this, um, with the, essentially the opposed D6s, there's, a, of course, a bit of randomness, but by piling on the DRMs, you move that 6x6 six six window of the available results around. So you, you really, in this case, as, as Sal has done, really push uh, the probabilities uh, to one outcome, and so, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, which I think yes. we're about to see. Yeah. Uh, and the Polish troops have nothing, so uh, I'll roll for the Axis, Germans, and of course, <laughs> uh. I did. I did my part not to move it very far. Yeah. But you can you can see the difference in the effect that the plus five made here, because you rolled a one. That's right. Uh, so a seven to one, a six to one is a DD result. Okay. So as you stated earlier, I will start by reducing the unit, which happens with a disruption result. Yes. And now you're forced to retreat. However, not having a location to retreat to, you're forced to take another step loss. And as a two-step unit, that would eliminate. Yes. So when a unit is eliminated, uh, it's placed in the eliminated box on its respective faction card. For those with the vassal module, if you right-click 
on the counter, you'll actually see an eliminate send to. You know, I'm, this is my first time with the updated module, uh, and, which the previous module was just fine, but this one is really mm -hmm. slick. <laughs> yes. So normally you can just drag it yeah. straight to there, um, or in this particular case, um, you can use this uh, update. Okay. So he's been eliminated, and for those of you seeing that there's an end of turn phase, there there will be eventually a multi turn process by which this unit could, should Poland survive the night, uh, mm -hmm. uh, go through mobilization and then uh, get placed back on the board. But for now, it's eliminated, uh, and right. Paulson has, uh, I believe, here shortly will have fallen. Right. So uh, the army is eliminated uh, uh, until I actually enter the hex. It's still considered. Uh, what you know, friendly to Poland. Uh, I will advance after combat, uh, which will uh, allow me to gain control of the city. Um, and and so going back go to the national will section of that player aid, um, by having lost that unit on a defense, I mm -hmm. lose a national will. Yes. The, the mothers of Poland grieve. Mm -hmm. Um. And this is going to be on top on what I'm about to incur after this uh, advance after combat. Right. So, uh, if, we'll, uh, if you want to move the army over to there, uh, we also now want to place in that hex a control marker. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Do they add that to the right click, or is this... Uh, no. Uh, no, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> there's... Yes, they do. If you right-click, oh, they've really? added the control marker. Uh, place marker control. Oh, boy, I never need to go into... Uh, and there it is, uh, on yeah. a layer underneath. All right, and so I went now go from 11 will down to 9 for having a domestic city uh, sacked. Mm -hmm. All right. Well played, good sir. <laughs> oh, so that cost me three move points. I've got five left. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, yeah. So um, I will now uh, move directly to the east. Now uh, there's a rail line that's crossing the river. Okay. Since I'm not entering an enemy zone of, con uh, since I'm not attacking across the river. I can use take advantage of the transport line's benefit of making everything considered clear terrain, okay, uh, or a clear hex side. So in this particular case, the river is not going to cost me any extra movement points. So it's just going to be one movement point to go into that hex. Leaves me with four. I've entered an enemy zone of control. My options are to stop or to attack. I'll choose to attack. All right. Um, uh, it's a clear hex, one movement point. I'm attacking a fair weather is another one. So it's two more movement points. Okay, the, uh, um, when we get to the commits here, the poles will not commit the remaining ground support. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I, uh, I will see if I can actually try to pile it on and maybe wipe the unit out. So I'm going to commit the fourth Luftwaffe will fly again. So I will... And air support. Okay. And so, uh, folks following along can see just now how intuitive we have. We've got two for being German. There's nothing in the way. It's a vanilla hex. We've got the air. So we're looking at the four for the Germans. Mm -hmm. Now I've got this little white stripe, which I think is probably a bad thing. Yes. Uh, so if you have a white stripe, uh, if you have a stripe going across your nationality and flag at the bottom of the counter, that means your your ground unit is reduced. And if it's a reduced, uh, it has a minus two DRM. Excellent. So this opposed roll will then be at uh, plus four minus two. <laughs> yes. And the, the lowest result that you can get on a CRT is one, regardless of modifiers. So there is, you know, in, in, a, in the worst case, if things are absolutely terrible, one is still a one. Sure. Eight. All right, so I will roll. <laughs> I gotta wonder uh, about the the server here. If I get, oh, yeah, there, there, there are some things that aren't one. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, I'll okay. take my one. 
Um, and I'll and uh, I'll take uh, five. Five, yeah. So I didn't quite do what I was hoping to do here. Um, so a five to uh, one is a dr. And I will create the semblance of a line. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, I can advance after combat, or I can choose not to. I have two movement points left. Um, I will take that and we'll move the eighth army into loads. Which, so again, uh, we've now just lost control. Um, the Poles have just lost control of another city, so that's going to cost me two more national will. And importantly, mm -hmm. for subsequent activations, folks, you see we have kind of the same pattern forming here, where I've got German units exerting zones of control in 2933, 2732, and 2833. So yet again, I have a Polish army that's isolated. Right. Uh, now I'm going to uh, just, instead of continuing, I'm going to just sure. highlight some different examples of things uh, to show. So uh, you have to be careful about creating traffic jams for yourself because you cannot uh, overstack, even temporarily, uh, when you have enemy zones of control involved. So for sake of argument, let's um, say we, the Lotz army is wiped out by the second panzer army. So if you just want to slide it out of the, out of the way. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, if we take the second Panzer Army and we advanced into the hex where uh, the Lotz Army was, now we could not move into 2733 where the Eighth Army is, because that would create an overstacking situation right. with an enemy zone of control there. Um, if we take the second, uh, put the second Panzer back where it was in 2831. Yep. Uh, now, uh, under the air unit is also uh, a, a German ground unit, the 10th. Now, in that particular case, the German 10th is not in an enemy zone of control. The second Panzer Army could move through that hex and continue out, say, next to Krakow. That's, that's a legal move, because there's okay. no enemy zone of control. Uh, it could not end there. It could not end in the 10th Army's hex. So it's not as, you could not do something where, say, you move the second Panzer into that hex and the activation of the second Panzer army and then move the German 10th army out. Right. Because that's an overstack situation. Got it. Yep. And that would be fun. Okay. Um, and if we want to, uh, if we could just reset the second and the, and the Lotz armies back. Uh, yeah, sure. So we've got the second here in 2831. Uh, where'd Lotz go? Oh, yep, this guy. Uh, who's here? Okay. And then if we could take the the retreated uh, Plummer's army mm -hmm. back into 2633. Okay. The 8th army back to 2632. And so now in that attack... Uh, oh, and we can get rid of the... Get rid of the control marker. Okay. So in the, in the attack, uh, I was hoping to roll better than a 1. <laughs> And uh, actually we get a DD or a DE result, which would have eliminated um, that army. Right. Um, for sake of example, let's say that's what happened. Okay. Now, um, I was able to do that, and I still had six, uh, I used six out of eight movement points to do that. Now, when you eliminate an enemy army, in the hex where the defender was, you would not, you would, typically put a no EOZ, no EZOC marker in that hex. Uh, grab one of those real quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I and mean, we haven't done this before because in all the other places where we eliminated armies, there was no enemy zone of control being exerted there. But in this particular case, the, Prus the Prusi army is is exerting a zone of control in all its six adjacent hexes. However, we eliminated that army and created what the game, we, other games would call a breakthrough situation. Um, so for the purposes of the rest of the 8th Army's activation, there's no enemy zone of control in that hex. 
So if it wanted to, with its two remaining movement points, it could advance after combat, and then it still has two movement points left. It could either attack, or if it wanted to, it could actually continue moving into that hex, correct? Now, when this uh, dissolves at the end of its activation, uh, he may run into problems himself now with isolation. Uh, yes, correct. If, if nothing else changed on the map, mm -hmm. we would have a... In fact, for sake of supply purposes, let's leave it as it is. Okay. Okay. Um, the after a player has done all his actions in his operations phase, he checks for the supply of his units. Mm -hmm. In for land, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you start with the unit. You trace up to two hexes to a transport line, mm -hmm. and then along the transport line back to a city in your home country that's friendly. Um, you're not allowed in that trace to uh, enter an enemy zone of control. So if we were to try to trace supply for the 8th Army, it could not do so. Because right. the German 8th Army uh, has uh, zones of control all, all around it. Right, so if we were to, we, uh, uh, using these uh, control markers, we can see that poles have control on each of these hexes. Right. And so he has no, no supply. Right. Uh, and then if a unit has no supply, it drops one supply state. So you have three supply states in the game, full, low, and no. Um, and so then it would drop down one level. That's the most it can ever drop in one specific turn. Okay. And from low it goes to no, and then after no you start a trading units. Right. And this is, while uh, not certainly an ideal uh, place to be, um, there will be times when a player, particularly I'm thinking about the Case Blue game, where you are just driven by, say, the approaching weather or whatever it is, to really push yourself to the end of your potential supply and get yourself in situations where you may run out of your supply line to, yeah. to cut off the enemy. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a risk and gamble that players have to make on their own. And whether it's successful or not ultimately depends on how it plays out. <laughs> um, all right. There's supply. I want to quickly talk about um, air units okay. and naval units. So... If we just go to up, up a little north to Konigsberg there, and just slide the sorties marker off the air unit. All right, so uh, ground units, we talked about having uh, full strength sides, reduced strength sides, or just reduced strength sides. Air units don't operate in that way. Air and naval units use a sorties system. And basically, any time you activate an air or naval unit to do something, whatever it might be, uh, it will incur at least one sortie doing that. If it happens to fight combat, it may incur more, mm -hmm. uh, but doing something will incur at least one. Uh, an air naval unit can keep doing something up until it hits its, a six sortie limit, in which case you can see on the marker it says cannot activate. And in general, these units, once they get to five or so sorties, are, are fairly impotent in a contested situation. Right. Yes, okay. correct. Uh, also, the number of sorties you have, as you see also on the marker, is a modifier uh, in combat. So the more sorties you have, the less effective you are in combat. More likely it is, therefore, that you'll take more sortie hits. If we take a quick look at the CRT... we'll find that that's where these plus numbers come into play. Um, these plus numbers represent sorties hits or additions. So let's say that we're, having, we're fighting an, an air-to-air, -air, you know, two air units are involved in a, an attack um, and they have to fight each other. You go through the same sequence. Each side determines its own modifiers, any event markers that might come into play. 
each side rolls its die, uh, finds its results. So let's say that you have a situation where the attacker rolled a, to get a final result of six, and the defender's roll, the result was a three. A six to three is a DR plus two. In that situation, the attacker would incur one sortie. It's not listed on the table because it's just one mm -hmm. for winning. But the defender would incur two sorties instead of one. And then the DR or the DD or the AA or the AS, those w would indicate something else for what was happening, what the reason for the combat uh, occurring. It, it might be uh, you've stopped, uh, you've interdicted a, a movement of some type, mm -hmm. you've interdicted supply, uh, you simply have won air superiority, etc. And that will and, pile on the sorties. And those, that will pile on the sorties. Uh, the catch here is that, again, as long as you have less than six, you can do doing something. So you can take a fresh air unit, use it multiple times, drive it up to six sorties. Your catch is that the most you can ever recover is two within a turn. Um, so it takes time for air or naval units to get back up to full strength, if you will, or full effectiveness rather than full strength. I, I prefer to think of this as effectiveness rather than... Um, sure. And at the, and the level that we're, you're, you're, you've designed here, I mean, this is a, a Luftwaffe. This is an air force. And so this represents right. um, planes getting broken, uh, planes getting shot down, spares being exhausted, et cetera, et cetera. All the things yep. that go into keeping an air force operational. Right. Okay. Uh, and and uh, Air and naval units to remove these sorties are very expensive in terms of production points. Unlike a ground unit where you pay a point or two points to move it, mm -hmm. uh, you don't do that with an air and naval unit, uh, but it does cost you a significant amount of production points to reduce sorties. So, for example, a fighter unit, um, in the Luftwaffe in this case, it costs three production points to remove up to two sorties. A Western bomber or a Western surface fleet, four sorties. Right. A carrier, five production points. And so, yeah. this, this is a tremendous sink uh, mm -hmm. for these forces. And and oftentimes, players, you'll find yourself with a fleet just hovering at minus four. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and you're just slogging. It's like a boxer at the end of the night. You're just, you can feel them just slogging it out with these really uh, dismal rolls. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, any questions before I continue? Good. All right. All right. Um, so we're going to uh, supply. I was just asking if you ah, had okay. questions on the mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so um, we we've kind of covered that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we'll we'll uh, move on to. Uh, I right. think I want to move on to diplomacy. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. And and. and okay. Here we and go. we can always possibly do another event to talk more about air and naval. Yeah. Un unless um, someone has. Would like to cover that right now. Well, let's go ahead and uh, hit diplomacy, and I'll zoom the map mm -hmm. out here a little bit so we can see all the miners, yep. or a number of them. Okay. All right. So, um, like you were stating, all of these steps in the sequence of play happen in faction order. Axis uh, starting. I'll open the diplomacy cup here for those of you playing with your physical copy at home if you guys are lucky enough to have your hands on one uh, these will be chits that you throw in a empty mug not your coffee mug don't do that yeah <laughs> but uh, we have a uh, an empty stack here and by the way i meant to mention this uh, as we got going here congratulations on uh, getting the reprint lined up and the mounted map uh, p500 uh. options i know there's a lot of players very excited about getting their hands back on the game or or upgrading their copy Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, it's, it was nice to, to do. But, but uh, it probably has affected the one shrink rack copy I'm planning to sell. 
<laughs> well, you got to wait for the second brain to run. Now, is this? Is yeah, this... That's, that's, oh, in case anybody would, does not have a, uh, an actual uh, physical copy of the first edition of the game, I have one that I plan on selling. So, if you want, you can just email me. Well, you tear the corner of the shrink, get your your silver sharpie out, and you can uh, yeah. <laughs> recover a little bit of that value. Now, is this is this uh, second that um, printing we're going to see? Is this strictly a, a reprint, or are there um, errata incorporated into the various? It, it will it will incorporate all the errata that, that's 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 in the game. There won't be any additional components sure. added to it, uh, but all the errata will be incorporated, and hopefully, nothing new will come out of the printing. That's <laughs> you know, bad. Sure, and, um, and this is a, a a paper map printing with uh, the mounted map being a P five hundred option for really anyone. Yes, okay. correct. Yeah, the 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 second the printing is strictly with the paper map, and the mounted map has to be ordered separately. All right, uh, and they'll have to get enough enough pre orders for to make it uh, cost effective for them. All right, you hear this, folks? That means head to the GMT site, get on the P five hundred, get your mounted map. <laughs> All right, so, so we're here in the Diplomacy Cup, and for the sake of argument, uh, the Germans have spent the uh, requisite um, production on the Diplomacy Cup, which, uh, for looking here on the production segment, is a five production. So not a not insignificant amount of production uh, in diplom yeah, if you, Diplomacy. Right. If you consider Germany's production at the start of the turn was you know, 26, you're talking about one-fifth of their, almost one-fifth of their production. And, if, uh, and the even Allies more so. Even more. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so you have bought your production. Right. So if we can um, empty, I'm going to empty out the. Yeah, go for I'm it. just going to pull out everything that's in the. Well, you might get them all in the first couple pulls. There you go. <laughs> right. um, I'm gonna, for people who are not familiar with the game, I'm going to show them how this works. Sure. Um, Uh, and the vassal module randomly pulls these out, so you don't have to um, worry about it. So, in diplomacy, you spend five production points, and you have uh, one of two options: either you randomly draw one marker from the cup, or you could put markers back into the cup. You can't do both in the same turn. You can only spend five points maximum to do one of those things. Doesn't matter how many production points you have left. As you can see, there are uh, six no event markers. One political failure, three political successes, and two area seized. Okay. Um, so, if you pull a no event marker, nothing happens. Five points down the drain. But you have affected the odds of the, uh, your opponent in some way. Uh, if you pull a political success... That allows you to uh, influence a minor country in some way. You can uh, take uh, a minor country that has no leanings whatsoever and then put a friendly pro-faction marker on it. So if we can find one of those. Yeah, I've got, I've got a pro-axis here. I'll just go ahead and drop okay. it. And, yep. And so... You would, uh, you would take that and you would place it on a country's capital, a neutral country's capital, uh, if there was nothing there. Uh, the catch is, well, for political sex success, it does not matter where you, you put it uh, on the map. So in this particular case, let's say that the Axis player had pulled a political success, he could put it on Italy. Drop that there. So there on Rome, you see the pro axis, and they are on the continuum halfway to uh, the axis. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, a political failure works in the opposite direction. Basically, your opponent gets to influence a minor. Um, so if we take away that pro-axis marker, just throw it into the ocean briefly, whatever. Sure. If the axis player um, had pulled the political failure, which is actually what I did, <laughs> the, um, the western player, in this particular case, pro -western. Would, would probably take a pro-western marker, 
and put it somewhere. Right. And they can select Italy. The games, you know, the game does not uh, start any of the neutrals leaning one way or another. I, I think my favorite um, diplomacy set of um, potential uh, strange alt histories was a early, like first turn German political failure, and just for fun, I decided to open up the uh, the uh, British Western Front. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a Western political failure. So I decided to start opening up the <laughs> the Great Britain Western Front. Uh, oh, <laughs> and you put it in. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> <laughs> turn, um, turn or so later, Ireland joins the Axis, and that was an interesting situation. Fascinating. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, from a design standpoint, I felt that the um, the politics of the era were much more chaotic than hindsight seems to give uh, credit to. Okay. Uh, now, I, I certainly could understand how you know some alliances were not likely to ever happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt uh, for making the game more interesting and to re better reflect that his uh, historical uh, chaotic uh, time period mm -hmm. that uh, none of the neutrals uh, lean one way uh, or the other. Uh, but it's very, very simple to house rule something to your preference. So sure. if you feel that Italy joining the uh, Allies either breaks the game or is too ahistorical or would never happen, it's very easy to just say the best that they could ever do is be pro-Western pro leaning but never actually join the Allies. Well, but uh, from a personal standpoint, you know, part of the joy of this game is the, the, the broad brush that it allows in terms of looking at potential what ifs and from a, a balanced game standpoint you know this 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 is a, a known cup and it's five production for anyone mm -hmm. and, and so um italy is a known known for for both sides and it represents a very interesting well what if mussolini hadn't uh you know stayed in power and there were you know uh, that they ended up uh siding and and the, what does that mean for the german player and uh, it certainly right. does make the game uh, increase the fun of the game and, and uh, introduce a lot of potential different strategies, particularly when you start getting away from the core European uh, uh, minor powers. You know, start seeing what happens, say, if Turkey goes one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree, and um, I, I find that much more uh, f fun to play with. But <laughs> I do understand that there are you know many gamers who uh, they're able. Uh, only willing to stretch uh, old history so far. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, all right, and so we we've covered the political failure, the political success, mm -hmm. the no events. Um, uh, we've got the area C's, and, and as long as they're here by the cup, we also now have these pro markers. So let's let's um, right. How does so that the we can talk about the area C's. Yep. Um, I think. Well, I can't seem to move. Ah, there we go. I'm just trying to move it. Mark over. So, if we go over to uh, Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. and um, if we can remove the diplomacy cup for for now. Okay. So we uh, we take a look at Eastern Europe. You will see there are the Baltic state countries, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. You will also see on the eastern part of Poland, you'll say Eastern Poland. Um, you'll also see uh, a red border for those who are uh, not colorblind. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those that are, it runs um, from Lithuania just to the east of Brest. It continues down. Um, those areas are considered dis are called disputed areas in the game. Uh, they start under the control of one country, but that territory may cede to a different country. Um, which country it might cede to is listed in red with the, little num the nationality in the parentheses. So you'll see Eastern Poland says Eastern Poland USSR. So it starts as part of Poland, um, but 
through this area seized marker, uh, if that gets pulled, uh, then regardless of who pulled it, the Soviet faction gets to select one of these disputed areas. And that territory becomes ceded to the Soviet Union. Uh, and at, from that point on to the end of the game, it's considered part of Russia, the USSR. And does it matter uh, if uh, who, uh, which faction Poland is aligned with or, or if they are conquered or not? Well, they have to be neutral to begin with. Sure. Um, uh, there is an exception with Eastern Poland. If Eastern Poland is conquered and the Nazi-Soviet pact is in effect still, mm -hmm. then Eastern Poland automatically is ceded to Russia. I see. So, it's so that's it's built into the system that way. It's okay. part of the pact. It, so rather than have the uh, Russian player declare war, mm -hmm. move some troops into what would be empty space, <laughs> mm -hmm. it just automatically happens. Okay. Uh, if a country uh, were already active, then the area seized marker couldn't be used to grab it. So, if, for sake of argument, Lithuania was, you know, an active country, mm -hmm. then uh, and an area seized marker was pulled, Russia could not uh, have Lithuania ceded to it. And uh, same thing, I believe there's a, a segment of Romania that could be ceded. Yes, yeah, the Bessarabia section of uh, Romania. Which is on the mm -hmm. west uh, eastern border, and then there's also the Varelia regions up in uh, Karelia regions up in uh, Finland. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the the winter the 1939 uh, winter war would be simulated with an, an area seized marker. I see. Okay. Um, and again, this was done for simplicity's sake. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, and so that can, yeah. then covers the area seized marker and its effect. Um, what about these pro markers? Okay, so pro markers. Uh, so the pro markers that are there right now, we we just use them as a holding place for um, for having pulled a political success marker. Um, but in the game, if uh, say the Axis conquer, if you anybody conquers a country, they get to take a pro-faction marker and put it in the diplomacy cup. So let's say that on the first turn um, Poland was conquered um, Germany would, uh, the Axis player would take a pro-Axis marker and throw it in the diplomacy cup. Uh, if at some point in a, diploma, in a later diplomacy phase the Axis faction pulls a pro-axis marker out of the cup then that would be the equivalent of an axis getting the political success event and if instead one of the allies pulls it then it's simply removed from the cup altogether okay now normally what happens in the, in the diplomacy phase is when uh, if let's I'm going to move these um, mm -hmm. pro markers out of way I'm going to throw all these back in the cup It's going to be a faster way to do this, right? That's probably the right. No, but that didn't work. Okay. Now, um, these pro mark, pro faction markers are not in the cup at all, so let's ignore them for now. So normally, an Axis player goes first, spends his five points, draws a marker, no event. Now, after it's drawn, it's placed in a holding box up over here in Vassal. Okay. And on the map there's a down, yeah, here we go. down at the bottom. There's right under French North Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, then the Brit Western player goes, draws, they got a political success, they do something with it. Soviet player goes, draws, they got a no event. These sit here. Now as I said, you can spend five points and you can draw from the cup, or you can put markers back into the cup. As you can quickly see, the more markers that come out of the cup, the easier it is to determine the odds of pulling something else out of the cup. 
Right. Uh, and there comes a point where you then have to decide, uh, am I better off drawing or affecting your my opponent's ability to p- pull something that's effective for them? So uh, let's say it's the next player's the, it's next turn. The Axis player decides they want to they prefer to mess with the uh, uh, well let's say it's the next turn the Axis player draws from the cup okay. pulls a no event so now the uh, Western player goes and decides well I'm going to see if I can help out my Soviet ally rather than draw from the cup they're going to spend five points and they're going to put a marker back in the cup mm-hmm. they're allowed to take any marker that's sitting up here already pulled and put it back in the cup so they'll start with a political success and they'll throw it back in the cup now here's the catch if you do that and there is also a no event marker sitting already drawn in this holding box it gets dragged along with it okay so you uh, you cannot guarantee yourself a pull of some kind right if there's a no event out there so I wanted to make pe- you know people aware of that. Sure. And then the, the Soviet player pulls and sees what they get, and it's a no event. Right. And, and so, uh, interestingly, from a, a how things go, as a Soviet player, I may have preferred the cup as it was, since I then had a greater chance of pulling one of those areas seized. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> but, of course, everyone at the table knew that, and so... Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Fascinating. We'll get that off of uh, FDR's head. There you go. Yeah. So then we have these uh, pro-faction markers. So I said, if you conquer a country, you get to uh, put one of those in the in the cup. So let's say that Germany had conquered Poland, they would take the pro-axis marker and they throw it in the cup. Something else that the Germans get to do when they've conquered a country, in this particular case, is they get to take uh, a pro-faction marker and al- also place it adjacent to the just-conquered country. Right, and so in this case, let's say Poland does share a border with Hungary, right? Mm-hmm. So, not if I turn the counters back on. That could shove outright Hungary one closer to. Right. Uh, and then uh, let's go and we'll pull from the diplomacy cup. We get no event. If the Axis player. Now, there's a political success. If the Axis player had pulled that, they could do. Oh, here. Let me, I'm going to take uh, the pro Western marker and I'm going to throw it on. Rome. Okay. All right. So the Axis player pulled a political success marker. I'll throw it over here. They have several choices with the on map situation. They can uh, get another pro Axis marker and put it in another neutral country. Okay. All right. So for sake of argument, they could throw it in. Oops. What, did, what happened there? They could take it and put it in Belgrade. Yep. So. Now Yugoslavia is also leading Axis. They could instead take a country that already has a pro-Axis marker and activate it. So now... So that would then bring the Hungarians active on the Axis side and their uh, deep bench order of battle... Uh, <laughs> yes, all three armies. Yeah, yeah, they would join the actively become an active country in the, on the map. Um, okay, and be part of the allies. Well, the, the last thing that they could, the Germans could have done with that political success, is taken and removed an enemy pro faction marker. So they could have taken the pro Western marker and gotten it out of Rome, bringing Italy closer to you know true neutral excellent 
Now, if we continue drawing, it was an area C, so that would see something. Eventually, you'd get to pulling. Eventually. Pro somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There it is. Yes. So, again, uh, if the faction that, if, that pulled this marker, if it's uh, friendly to that faction, in this case, if the axis drew pro axis, it would be the same as a political success. If the allies pulled it, it would be uh, deleted, just removed altogether. All right. Something uh, new players uh, make a mistake of at times is uh, they'll go and they put a, a, you know, say they've conquered a country and they put a friendly faction, the pro marker in the diplomacy cup. They then draw it and they end up putting it back up here. Oh, and they keep it circulating? And they keep it circulating. And that's, you do not do that. Sure. Any, any pro uh, faction marker that gets pulled from the diplomacy cup is set aside, not, you know, with the other unused counters. And so then I suppose some of the other overarching um, observations on the diplomacy system uh, would be that this is generally generally a campaign game mechanic. Most of the smaller scenarios have set sides. Is that yes? Okay. That's right. Yeah, the, the diplomacy uh, on the smaller scenarios, the diplomacy phase is almost always skipped. Okay, and then oh, this would then also generally be an early game. Uh, type of activity once the war gets going I believe you say as, as a designer comment in the rule book uh, once everyone's shooting no one's talking that's right yes uh, diplomacy occurs as long as there is a major uh, peace policy in effect that being uh, either appeasement the Nazi Soviet pact or uh, if Russia ends up being conquered uh, Collapsed, not conquered, sorry. Mm -hmm. Collapsed, then there's uh, the Moscow Treaty um, that goes into effect, which is very similar to the pact in the sense of, you know, there's no fighting. I see. And for a time, between. then, that would open back up diplomacy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but if, there, if there's no peace policy in effect, then there is no diplomacy happening. I see. Um, you can still declare war on each other, you know, on countries, that's fine. Um, you don't going to full out war doesn't reset the diplomacy marker sure um, uh, anything that's already been pulled stays pulled anything that's still in the cup stays in the cup and should diplomacy start up again you go from that point well excellent well uh, thanks for that thorough review of the diplomacy system I think with maybe our, our last handful of minutes here it'd be good to yeah. uh, open the floor um, I, I believe at least I hope we still have a handful of people in the Vassal lobby, which we do, and uh, um, a couple people on uh, the Skype. So uh, you've you've got them here, folks. Uh, Designer Salvas. Any questions on the game, its systems, or uh, what he had for dinner? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, oh, well, left, we leftover baked leftover baked ziti. In oh, case anyone was wondering. <laughs> Uh, we joke within within the Reddit community. There's a, there's an activity called an "Ask Me Anything," which which uh, ostensibly is okay. Just ask questions. I'll do the best I can. Um, uh, usually, it's not anything, but but uh, yes. anyway, that's what the bumper sticker says. So okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and it, you know, if you have just general design questions, that's fine as well. It doesn't. Uh... Um. I, I suppose um, uh, one question would be maybe not so much on the design, but uh, on the pitch. How how did you get uh, noticed uh, or or get this uh, idea in front of uh, a publisher? Uh, uh, I did so at, at conventions. Okay. Um, I'm I'm lucky that there's I, I live in uh, the northwestern uh, part of. Virginia, okay. uh, about an hour and a half from Charlottesville, and there's a, a gaming convention that occurs there uh, in February, and and now also in uh, end of June. Mm -hmm. um, and GMT and a few other publishers uh, go there. Um, this is that was the first convention where I 
brought very early prototypes uh, of the game and, and showed it to them. And then I also took um, a trip out to uh, Tempe in Phoenix for uh, Constant Expo or Monster Con, for those people old enough to remember it, mm-hmm. called that. Uh, that's a convention that is made for some serious war gamers in terms of large size games. Um, for those who are new to the war gaming community, uh, this may seem large. It's two maps, um, and it's it's not small. Two maps is you know it's a big footprint um, for sure. But there are um, other games that are. Uh, Four plus maps. They have thousands of counters. Um, it, it's it's an investment. Yeah, I would say this game, while large in scale, we're talking armies in a theater, uh, mm-hmm. and, and one month turns is certainly uh, manageable in its uh, mechanics and its scope. So, um, I always yeah. enjoy, like I said earlier, I always enjoy pointing people towards um, Case Blue and C three I. Uh, who are getting started? I, I think that's probably one of the best magazine games published, as far as you know. Uh, I, I, I like that one photo of people playing Case Blue on the Unconditional Surrender box. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's that's a great picture. Um, so it's very different than the MMP version of Case Blue. <laughs> yeah, yes, slightly. Yes. Speaking of you know large games, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and for those of you who are, are still seeing the stream here, uh, Case Blue, that game uh, in C3I, essentially covers the area of the map I've got set up here with a, you know, a handful of uh, Axis country and a few miners and the Russians and a very limited clock to execute Case Blue before uh, winter stops you and then the Soviet counterattacks and a couple of other scenarios. So I mean, all of this, but just a really focused operation. Yeah, it's uh, simple. The map is on an eight and a half by eleven sheet, and everything's on an eight and a half by eleven. So, um, anyway, getting back to the question, I would, I, with showing it to publishers, that's yeah. that's where I got a chance to show it and do some early play testing and get a general sense of uh, interest as well. Um, you know, it's a strategic World War. Uh, two games. There have been some very great games out on that, mm-hmm. um, and so it. Uh, I had to get a feel for if anyone was interested in another one, and also the um, explain it and show it, uh, because just talking about the concepts, uh, I don't think would have been enough. I think people needed to see it in action sure because it it did do things differently than other many other games to do yeah. oh. it's it's not the first game that has you know single unit activation right uh, so, maybe uh, the first game with sorties as it's here mm-hmm. um, uh Gamator, did you have a so uh, how much play, play testing is needed how much playtesting is needed play- to put a game like this together? Uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, uh, it took seven years between the time um, I first showed it and it was published. Um, I would have liked to have been published a couple of years sooner, <laughs> personally. <laughs> uh, it did sit on P500 for a long time. However... I will state that those two extra years of playtesting allowed us to refine the game even more mm-hmm. and balance it even more. You know, the the game um, I think has a good reputation for one that stays competitive for most of the war that you're playing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that if it had been published sooner, we would have run into uh, other areas of the game might have broken down uh, because of, uh, an area wasn't fully fully tested. A game of this size and this scope, if you're going to allow for variability, requires a law a lot of play testing. Um, and 
how long is dependent on how many play testers you have. The more players that are playing the game and playing it repeatedly, the less time you need for play testing because you have more sample sizes. For quite a few years, the play testing was basically the design team. Mm -hmm. um, so. All right. Well, uh, I think uh, with that, Sal, I'll uh, thank you again greatly for, for joining me. Uh, really appreciate oh, yes. taking the time. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to take the opportunity, if we get a chance, to maybe do another event so I can show uh, overseas supply. Well, what I think might be fun as a follow-up, now that we've gone over yeah. uh, so much of the, the, the fundamentals mm -hmm. here of the game, would be potentially at some point in the future to uh, meet up and, and play the Mediterranean scenario. Oh, that would be fine. Um, and, uh, you know, we can move through kind of quickly uh, the parts that we have covered, but then, you know, when we get to the end of one of the operations phase, go, okay, so how does this work? <laughs> yes. And that, that's, that scenario worked out fine. It ended up being much more popular than I anticipated it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has a very low counter density, mm -hmm. and so we could easily get through several turns in, in the time. Well, we'll uh, look to get that on the schedule, and of course I'll look mm -hmm. to uh, make sure that we get the audio worked out beforehand. Um, everyone, uh, this has uh, been uh, Alec with uh, slash r slash hex encounter, joined by designer Sal Vasta of uh, GMT's Unconditional Surrender. Uh, thank you all, and good night. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks.